Welcome to Alaska Earthquake Science Facts. I'm Carl Tate. In 1958, a magnitude 7.8 earthquake created a landslide into Latuya Bay that generated a mega tsunami wave reaching 524 meters, 1,720 feet above sea level, the largest ever recorded. So let's start with just an excerpt from the Wikipedia entry on mega tsunami. It's defined as a very large wave created by a large sudden displacement of material into a body of water. And it actually depicts the 1958 Latuya Bay as uh, motivating what this concept is. And as it says here, it differs from a normal tsunami. A normal tsunami, as we'll see with the 1964 earthquake, is caused by tectonic motion of the seafloor during the earthquake going upward. And that upward motion displaces a lot of water that then propagates as a tsunami wave, in many cases across the entire Pacific Ocean. Those waves are very uh, shallow heights or low heights out in the main ocean and can reach up to about 10 meters as the seafloor becomes shallower near land, but nowhere near the kind of effects you can get in very local settings such as Latuya Bay, where the wave can essentially splash out caused by this motion uh, material falling into the water and displacing it. So very different concept, a mega tsunami from a normal tsunami, which are more prevalent in the geologic record and earthquake record. Here's our setting, Latuya Bay, fair weather range of the St. Elias Mountains, spectacular area of Southeastern Alaska. Latuya is a compound word in the Tlingit language, meaning the lake within a point. And the place is so called from the almost enclosed water within the extended spit. So here you have this almost cut off from the ocean and the lake within a point. So really apt uh, name for, for this region. Latuya Bay is a sacred place and was long inhabited by Alaskan natives up until about 1900. And I wanted to play an excerpt from uh, an interview done in 1998 in Yakutat uh, with Sally Edwards and Lorraine Adams. And I'll just play the, the part about their recollection of people living in this area. And what about the Tuya Bay? When, did, uh, when do you think it was abandoned? I don't know, but according to my auntie, they, uh, she was five years old when they moved out of the Tuya Bay, down to Dry Bay. And when would that have been, more or less? That, well, she was she she came to was born nineteen hundred, so that could be nineteen five. Um, so that gives us some idea that in the nineteen hundreds, while there weren't permanent uh, tribes and people living in this area, prior to that, it was a sacred place. There's archaeological finds from this area. There was source of uh, rookery here on this island and a long history prior to the 1900s of people living. So our setting, taking a step back, we're looking at Latuya Bay, which is right here, southeastern Alaska. We see from this online fault database, it is right on the Fairweather Fault, which is a strike slip fault system with the Pacific plate moving to the Northwest relative to the North American plate on the east. So this is the story is mostly about a mega tsunami, but the stage is set by a world class strike slip fault that helps define the topography and glacier routes in this region. We zoom in on that same database, we see the Fairweather fault running right along this line right here. So this major strike slip fault plate boundary between North America and the Pacific Yakutat plate here. And we can see this arrow is showing the initiation point of the rock slide from the earthquake in 1958 that caused the mega tsunami. But this provides a nice overview of the, you can see the, the glaciers flowing along these faults. Um, and really this is going to be the trigger for the mega tsunami. This will focus a lot on study by Don Miller from US Geological Survey in a report published in 1960. 
And it's interesting, it's described as a timely account of the nature and possible causes of certain giant waves with eyewitness reports of their destructive capacity. Why was this timely? Because in the 50s, these researchers were already studying evidence for previous giant waves in Latuya Bay. Um, and then much of this older evidence was wiped out in 1958. So the scientists were already on to something um, when this event hit. Here's a map from the uh, Miller report, kind of zooming in on the area. This is Latuya Bay shown right here. We have this fair weather fault. So this plate boundary is coming right up against, uh, right along the back end of Latuya Bay. And this shows Canada, US border. Zooming into the map of the event, this arrow shows the start of the rock slide. As we saw before, this shows rock slide and the fault running right under these two glaciers. So the shaking from this earthquake created a rock slide and the rock slide plunging into this fjord or deep, deep water bay uh, created this giant wave. And what is shown here in these dashed lines, it says trim line of destruction of forest by water, uh, showing approximate altitude above mean sea level. So basically we'll see this line marks where this wave just wiped out the forest along the side. You can zoom in to see a little better. We'll be looking at this kind of view. So there's a rock slide. There's a glacier, Latuya Glacier coming out here, Gilbert Inlet. And then this line is showing where the forest was wiped out by the wave that plunged in. So this is going to be the view in the next uh, scene. So here's a depiction from a published paper showing the basic scene of, remember, the Fairweather Fault is coming in and out here, right, right into under Latuya Glacier. And it's the shaking that sets loose a large amount of material up here that slides down into the water. Um, and displaces a huge amount of water that shoots right up the side of this. And, you know, just to get, you'll get a sense of scale when you start seeing some of the photographs coming up next. But this shows the basic setting for this mega tsunami. Here we have again the starting point, and you're looking at a photo taken uh, within a month or so after the event. And you can see the effects here where this was previously covered in forest. And as some of the material up here was previously part of the mountain. Another view of that. So this 524 meter elevation is up here and really is staggering to think of trees getting ripped off by the strength of this, this wave. So there we have 524 meters above sea level, highest elevation of trees destroyed by mega tsunami wave generated from the earthquake and rock slide. So that is a global record. There's no evidence of any such effect like this um, on the planet. And you can just kind of imagine yourself for scale. Um, these are very large trees shown here and they're just kind of knocked over like toothpicks. So a trim line is this upper limit of destruction of forest due to the wave. And so as I put here, so it's like a haircut, but with large spruce trees instead of hair. So you can see this very sharp line where the wave came through and just ripped out uh, all of these trees. You can see some of them tumbled over here. Stepping back in scale, you see the scope of this. So the rock slide started right here, plunged down, came up and over this and this huge wave on both sides coming out and wiping out uh, trees and forests on both sides as well as on this island. And I keep saying, imagine how big this was. Well, in fact, we don't have to imagine everything because there were, there were people there. There were three boats in the bay at the time and some lived to tell the story of what happened. Um, the boats were called the Badger, the Edry, and the Sunmore. And here's an excerpt from the map showing where the Badger was here toward the mouth of the bay, the Sunmore, and the Edry. And so here's an excerpt from just one of them. I included at the end notes longer text 
to see these uh, other descriptions. The badger still at anchor was lifted up by the wave and carried across the chasse spit, riding stern first, just below the crest of the wave like a surfboard. Swanson looked down on the trees growing on the spit and believes that he was more than two boat lengths, more than 80 feet above their tops. The wave crest broke just outside the spit out here and the boat hit bottom and foundered some distance from the shore. Looking back in time, the mega tsunami was caused by an earthquake and a rock slide. The mountains here are formed by active plate tectonics over millions of years. The Fairweather Fault has been active for millions of years. We can conclude that there have likely been hundreds of these events previously. And that leads to a fascinating artifact um, that's shown here in the National Museum of the American Indian. And I'll read an excerpt from a 1911 paper describing this. This legend of Latuya is illustrated by a carved wooden pipe of splendid proportions, which was obtained in 1888. from the chief of the Tuck Tainton family of the Hunakau, who claimed this bay as his hereditary sea otter hunting ground. It was used only upon occasions of particular ceremony when the clan assembled to honor the dead or to deliberate up upon some important question of policy. At one end is shown a frog-like figure with eyes of Heliotis shell, which represents the spirit of Latuya. At the other end, the bear slave sitting upon his haunches. Between them, they hold the entrance of the bay and the two brass covered ridges are the tidal waves they have raised underneath which cut out of brass is a canoe with two occupants that has been engulfed. And so this is a reminder of, as he describes the sort of sacred connection between the local Clinket native people here, and also the fact that these events had occurred prior to 1958. And some evidence for this is shown from this map, also from the Miller study. And what we see here is a trim line from 1853 or 1854. And how do they know that? Well, right here, just above the trim line is a location of a tree that was cut in 1953 to analyze and used to obtain this date. So they're taking a tree that's just above the mark. So you have to imagine the trees just below got wiped out by a massive wave. So you might imagine that the tree that just barely survives might have survived with some scars and that's exactly what happened. So this scarring in this tree shown at right is a key piece of evidence that they used to determine an approximate age of the previous event. So a tree just above the trend line showing evidence of injury and recovery based on the annual rings, there's about 100 just after the scar, the injury occurred in 1853 or 1854. So some of the oral traditions that have been discussed um, possibly originate from events, from this event or others. And looking forward, uh, the Latuya Bay mega tsunami and what happened has been a source of a lot of scientific investigations. This is a paper in 2020 looking at trying to understand how such large waves uh, can occur. And one of the key pieces is to understand the bathymetry of this bay. So it's a glacially carved place. And this bay is more than 100 meters deep. So it's really a lot of water to move as you drop um, this chunk of the mountain into it. So as I wrote here, you know, the pursuits of this mega tsunami continues with laboratory models, numerical models of landslide and of wave propagation. Um, and understanding the bathymetry, especially pre-1958, is key to properly modeling how this wave propagated. Takeaway topics for class. A mega tsunami is caused by the displacement of water by detached material at the Earth's surface, either from an 
above ground landslide, a submarine landslide, or something as dramatic as a meteor impact. It's displacing large amounts of water with something coming in from above falling down. A mega tsunami is influenced by the local topography and bathymetry, which are often shaped by active tectonics. In Latuya Bay, the steep slopes are adjacent to the Fairweather Fault, and the fjord is caused, is formed by past glaciation. Pre-1958, giant waves in Latuya Bay influenced the culture and traditions of local native tribes, such as the Huna Tlingit tribe. Thank you for watching. Stick around for supplemental material. This shows an expanded text excerpt from Emmons 1911 paper where he's describing um, some of the legends of the people in Latuya related to a lot of geological related um, aspects, which is interesting in the context of these tsunamis and earthquakes. And finally, this is some excerpts about the three boats that were in Latuya Bay in 1958. Um, and some of the people did not survive. <laughs>